Amen. Thank you. Can you hear me? I've got a big mouth. So you, there you go. No, I'll, it's by the grace of God I'm here and the interview committee knows why. Because if I reveal Tina's age, then I'm still alive. I've got a bigger honey-do list, but hey. But anyway, my wife, Tina, and she was going to exhort you in a second. And Kristen is my oldest. Then we got Kelsey. And then Katie is my three beautiful daughters. So uh, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be here today. Uh, it's always awesome to be able to bring and present the Word of God. Because anytime I don't look at my own abilities, I look at the ability of the Holy Spirit upon me to be able to minister the Word of God effectively. Because if I begin to look at myself, I would have done bailed out a long time ago. But we've got to learn to let the Holy Spirit, we have to yield to the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit teach us and show us and reveal. And I've put a lot of prayer into this message. Uh, and before I get right into it, I'll jump right into it if I'm not careful. I'm going to ask Tina to come up. She said that she has something she wants to show real quick. So you can't take that off my sermon time, right? I'm kidding. Hey, good morning. How is everyone? Oh, there's more faces here than I noticed being up here in the front. I didn't. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, but uh, yeah, it's such a beautiful group of people. Well, as I was praying, I asked the Lord to just give me a, just a short word for you. And amazingly, a little bird, so to speak, told us that this church was full of love. And I had to come and find that out for myself. And sure enough, so far we have seen amazing love. So when God gave me this scripture, I was like, okay, really? But he gave me 1 Corinthians 14.1, and he said, let love be your greatest aim. And I thought about that, and I thought, well, why would I need to tell the people that? And it's just, again, to encourage you to know that God loves you. He's not forgotten about you. You're ever on his mind. You stay on his mind continuously. And that he would have us not to look at outward appearances. They can be deceiving at times. But to look on the inward heart, the attitude of the heart. And as it appears, you're all beautiful people. And you're walking in love that just radiated when we walked in through the doors. And when we heard him practicing this morning, it was a, just a dedication to the Lord to keep in remembrance everything he's done for us. And when we look upon ourselves and we see all our flaws and our faults and our mistakes, we forget who brought us out of it. And I think about Jesus and what he's done for us. And I have to remind myself of where I was no matter what you're seeing right now, there was a time that I didn't have a Savior, that my destiny was hell. But now, praise God, and for many years now, and sometimes we take for granted how long we've walked, it, it's almost like we forget that we're walking in heaven every day. And then those little things that come and those little mistakes and the things we forget that, Jesus took care of all that. Jesus is in the business of restoration. He knew us before the foundations of the world. He knew us before our parents knew us. He knew us before we were in the womb. And he has and does have a great plan for us today. This is a new day. And that is one thing that I want you to hear today. This is a new day. Old things are passed away. No matter how bad, no matter how good yesterday was, today's a new day. A new beginning. A new beginning to go forward. A new beginning to go forward as a church. A new beginning to go forward as an individual. But keep love the greatest aim. And I love that scripture and I love how it's not just keep love your aim, but the greatest aim. Let that be in everything you say and do. Let love be your greatest aim. Amen. Amen. I 
believe I've just let her preach. Is that okay? Amen. Praise God. That, I know I, I kid around, but this coming year we'll be married 30 years. And we've done everything together. I mean, absolutely everything. I mean, when I say that, I mean it. <laughs> I mean, even in work, on the job, she's even came out and helped me before. I mean, roll up her sleeves and go out there and jump in. Uh, we literally have went to Bible school together through pastoral studies. Uh, we actually even got ordained the same time through Ken Kingria, through the IPHC. And, and that's a whole story by itself, how he, he directed our paths right in the path of Bishop Preston Mathena to start with. Because we, how many of you know a lot of times your plans are not God's plans? And a lot of times, you know... We, we look at things, and, I, and we came out of Bible school, and we began to say, wow, we're going to plant a church, Tina. Me and you, we're going to shoot for the moon, you know, like the old movie. I can't remember what it was. Old lady, won't you come out tonight? What was that when we watched it every Christmas? It's a wonderful life. We thought that was it. It's a wonderful life. And, uh, and it is a wonderful life. Just because we don't get exactly what we want does not make the life wonderful that we live in. God knows exactly what to give us. He is exactly right on times. Yeah, those times that the, the enemy will hinder. Those times that even the Apostle Paul, he hindered Apostle Paul to go to minister one time, as we read in, in the New Testament. But through all of it, God is still good. Amen. A lot of times what, what we see what we see, we think is a setback, is God is pulling us back to catapult us into the next journey, the next mission that God has for this church. And a lot of times we, we look and say, why did this have to happen? And you know, honestly, a lot of times God, I hate those times when you pray to God. <laughs> and you say, God, I want to I know, I want to hear your voice. And you say fast and do this and hang, on, hang from the rafters and hang on your head. Whatever you got to do, I want to hear from God. And he never talks. And then you pray and pray and pray and fast. And it's like, I still don't hear nothing. And in those hours are the most precious times being still before God. Because if he's not saying anything, you keep on doing what you're doing. Because God is moving you to the next mission of this church. And, and just to tell a little bit about us, I, I've jumped in a little bit ahead. But... The reason I was talking about how God can catapult you into the next step of your life, a little bit about this family. When Tina and I, when we got married, we, was, uh, we were living the American dream. We were looking for the, the nicest houses, uh, the nicest cars, and we thought this is what would bring us peace. We th I mean, we both had good jobs. We, at the time, we were both living in Winston-Salem. She was an engineer. I was... Uh, moving right up in heating and cooling and the service looking at a really good paying job as a service technician doing heating and air condition. And, and we, was, we was going forward with life till one day in in 1992 her dad had a massive heart attack. And as he had a massive heart attack we went and met him at the hospital in Abington, Virginia. And I've never seen anyone pass away with a smile on her face. Never. Her dad was a pastor. And still is. I mean, the gifts and callings are without repentance. You understand that. No one can take from you because Jesus gave you those gifts when he ascended on high. The ascension gifts. But her dad was a, a, the pastor. And... It was like a, anything, have you ever had anything in life just kind of shake you? And it's kind of like, pastors can't die. <laughs> I mean, I was young in the Lord and naive, and I'm thinking, pa how can pastors pass away? God has called them to minister and pastor and shepherd the people, but boom, it hit us right in the face. And then reality came in. The American dream wasn't the American dream anymore. The American dream was, okay, we want to seek God. We want to find out what the life is about. You know, you ever heard people say, what, what would you say life, what's the greatest thing in life? But we didn't know. 
We were both born again at an early age. We didn't understand. We, we, we were like a lot of Christians. We were born again and that was it. But how many of you know that there's a lot of benefits from being born again? There's so many benefits. I always say you, you, a lot of Christians don't take hold of the benefit package that is given to you once you are born again. Salvation is number one, of course. Salvation, heaven or hell. Salvation is number one right at the top. But there's so many more benefits from being born again. Even that word save, sozo, if you want to, want to look it up in the Greek, sozo, it, salvation covers so many things. Not just from being born again. But we, we was looking and we was desperately, and, and I guess you'd call us at that time because we didn't know no better, but we was looking and we was what, you've heard the term church hopping. I guess that's what people thought we was because we was here and we said, no, we don't have peace. We'd go to this church. No, we don't have peace. We'd go to this church. No, we don't have peace. And then one day, now this is a guy that's not been in church for a while. Been born again at an early age, but not been in church. Tina's dad's a pastor. She's not even in church. And we're looking. We're looking almost like that precious pearl that's in the ocean. And saying there's something out there more to life than what we're doing right now. So as we begin to look honestly I mean, no God knows what he's doing. But again, I mean, what we looked at as a setback. We, we looked at a setback, her dad passing away. But, you know, he got promoted, right? Because he's in heaven. He got promoted. But at the time, you know, if you're in the world, you know what I mean by living in the world and not in the spirit, or the spirit of God, then you look at things worldly. You know, death used to scare me. But now I know how precious it is in the eyes of God when his saints go on. Because death, like the Apostle Paul said, death where is your sting. It has no more control on you. Because when you do pass in this life, you go to eternity. And you know, what's cool about all of that, not getting off of my topic here, what's cool, he's preparing a mansion for us right now. I mean, he, he, I believe this all my heart. He's got a mansion up there. I love golf. I haven't played in several years. I'd probably hit the barn every time I hit a ball right now. But I love golf. I believe he's going to have a golf course beside my mansion. I do. I know, but, you know, I might be lusting a little bit right there now, but no. I believe he's going to have a golf course. I, I, I went in a home. I love woodwork. I love to see beautiful woodwork called his craftsmanship, which you don't see a lot anymore. If get it done and get it finished and get it out of the, out of the assembly line, which... That's the times we live and there's nothing wrong with that. But I love woodwork. I believe when I go in my mansion, there's going to be a big stairway and the wood is going to be stained. It's going to be beautiful. There's going to be a little pearl in it. There's going to be a little this, a little that, a little that. I know a lot of you think this guy is crazy. <laughs> but of course the number one thing is, and I think all of us will, is we're going to hit our face when we see Jesus. We're going to come face to face. And I don't think that mansion is going to be right here, right in front of us when we get to heaven. I, I know that with all my heart. I, I've had the Spirit of God speak to me like in an audible voice. And you ever heard that word reverential awe? And that reverential awe, I couldn't even, I hit my knees. I couldn't even speak. And in that moment, I knew what it meant by reverential awe. Because when, 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 you, you, when you step into the presence of the Almighty God, it's like everything else just stops. Because there's no time with God. It's eternal. It's eternal time. But we was looking for this. And, and at our house, we were living in Hillsville, Virginia at the time. And at, we had some friends come over and they was like, you know, again, we've not been in church in a while. And this was, I mean, this is way back in, what, 92, 96. It was 1996. How I many of you know women are detailed guys are just like, oh, it happened back then? But women can tell you the time, what you had on, what you're going to eat for supper, and what you bought at the market that night before you went to bed. But men are like, oh, I went to the market. I don't know when it was, but we got something to eat, and we went home and we ate. Amen. But women are detailed. They are. It's just a different personality than God. And thank God, I wouldn't want to be married to a wife that I look like a guy. You know, because she's beautiful. <laughs> I'm going to make a blush over there. But we was looking for this, and some friends came by our house and said, hey, they're having a revival up in, and it was in Whitfield. 
And so they're having a revival. Why don't, why don't we just go? And we're like, oh, okay, let's just go. So we piled up in our cars, and, and we headed off to Whiffle that night for the revival. And the, again, how you know, God knows what he's doing. I'm going to keep emphasizing that. What we thought was a setback, God was catapulting us forward. If you've ever seen a slingshot, in order to get velocity on whatever you're throwing out of that slingshot, you've got to pull it back. And then when you let it go, it will sling forward with a lot of velocity. And this is what God was getting ready to do and take place in our life. As we went to this revival, this revival changed our lives forever. To go in detail, both of us during this revival were literally baptized with the Holy Spirit. We were filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and one of the things that, that right after that is we, we got filled. And, and I think about Matthew 5, 6 where it says, Those that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. It's in the Beatitudes. And we was hungry for the things of God. We didn't know what we needed, but the Holy Spirit knew what we needed. The Holy Spirit unctioned us to go to this church. And we came to the revival and as we was at the revival, now Tina, the again guys are different. You see, I was brought up, and nothing against the Baptists or the Methodists or any of that, but I, the, the, the one that I sit on, the again, I'm not condemning nobody, but I was taught that tongues is of the devil. I was taught all kinds of things that was not biblical, but I didn't know. So you can imagine when people were praying in tongues, and people are trying to get you to receive the Spirit of God, you're like, whoa! You know, no, that's not for me because, you know, I, I've heard about this. This is not God. And I literally, and that's where our text is going to in just a second, is 1 Corinthians 12 if you want to go there. But I literally, and you see, how many of you know you're more accountable? More accountable, I didn't even say that right. You're more accountable when you know more things about God. You know, what he did, how many of you know, is it just me, when you was a baby Christian and you was praying for healing and God supernaturally heals you, and then as you get older in the Lord, it's not just, okay, God, heal me. He expects you to operate in a greater faith. And that's what God wants you to be. He wants you to operate in a greater level with him. He's always wanting to move you from glory to glory to glory. Amen? He wants this church to move from glory to glory to glory, to glory. I'm all about the Spirit of God, and, and that's why I wanted to show this this morning, give a little bit of story about us. But I was at the table, dining room table, that night after we came back for the revival. Now, I wasn't completely dumb, a little stupid, but not dumb. And I said, God, if this is you, will you please show me in your word? If this is you, I want it. But if it's not, I don't want it. So, he, I literally had my Bible, and I opened it up. Like I said, more accountable. Now God expects you to find it for yourself, not only because you should be studying the Word, meditating on the Word, and so forth. But it literally opened up to 1 Corinthians 12, and that's where we're going to start at today. It's now concerning, and I've got the New King James. You might have the King James, or another translation, but now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. You see, he's getting, beginning to talk to me here. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So right here he opened up to me the, literally, you cannot curse God when you're speaking in the Spirit. You, it only says that Jesus Christ is Lord, but by the Spirit. Amen? So he began to reveal that to me. And then, later on, we went back the next day. And lo and behold, after a little tugging and pulling, I was filled with the Holy Spirit because I received it. How I many of you know it's a free gift that God wants you to have? I would be, I don't know where I would be today. if the, All of this has catapulted us forward. It's all because of the Holy Spirit. Everything we do, we eat, breathe, drink by the Spirit of God. Everything we do consumes our life by the Spirit of God. 
And shortly after that, and we're going to, we're going to continue down in 12 here in a minute, but shortly after that, I began to get, a, I got so hungry for the Word of God. I was hungering and thirsting, and God, God was opening the Scriptures to me. He was beginning to reveal the Scriptures to me. We were getting uh, busy in the church. We started attending this church where we were filled with the Holy Spirit, and we got active in the church. We were children pastors for about 11 years, I believe it was. We did youth men, so we did anything we could find a hand to. We were so hungry for the things of God. We were like, here we are, God. What do you want to use us for? So as, as we got busy doing the things of God and praying, then, how you know, a setback will catapult you forward again. You think it's a setback. And I was out working, and it was a Wednesday night when, you know, we were both getting ready to go to church. And as we were both getting ready to go to church, I got a call from my mother that said, your uncle's had a massive heart attack. And he's already, he, he, he died before they got there. They revived him on the way to the hospital. He's died about at least ten times. That, at least. I heard different people in the EMS say different things. But he, he had at least ten times he had passed away and died with a massive heart attack. And, and I told my mom, okay, I want to go to the hospital. I want to go see him. And... I had the zeal in me. How many of you know once you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you've got zeal? You've got zeal. And, and you don't care. You've got that zeal down, that fire down on the inside of you. And I told Tina, I said, you, you take the kids, you, you go on to, to church. I need to go see my uncle. And as I went to see my uncle, I'll never, how many of you know that, a side note here, God just doesn't fill you with his spirit for no reason. That there's a purpose behind it. Do you understand that? God doesn't waste time on anything. He loves you. He's slow, slow to anger. He's a compassionate God. God is love. But he doesn't waste his time on anything. So, as I got to the hospital, his wife was outside of the intensive care ward. And at the swinging door, she was standing right, right outside. Her kids was in the room back with, with him, my uncle. And she was crying out, Lord, have mercy on him. God, help him. Just crying out to the top of her voice, God, help him. Have mercy on him. You see, what a lot of people didn't know that my uncle wasn't saved. So if he died, guess what? I put the big if in there, because we're going to get that in a minute. But if he died, he would be facing eternity with hell. You understand that? Extreme darkness. The stench of smoke. You've got the bottomless pit, the flames of fire. We've got all of this, the lake of fire. We've got all of this. And, and this is running through my head as I'm going to the hospital. Cause he, I knew he wasn't born again. I knew that he wasn't a Christian. And, and I knew that something had to be done. And as I came in, which we're going to go down through here in a minute, but as I came in, it was like a coat was put on me. When I came into the hospital, and I came up to her, the double doors, and I asked, I said, where's he at? What room's he in? And it was like a coat, like the spirit of the living God landed upon me. And this has only happened two or three times in my life. But it was like a, a coat, almost like a mantle, was dropped down on me, on the inside of me. And as I went through those doors and found the room that he was in, I began to pray with him. And as I began to pray, the Spirit of God came on me. It, it, was, it was a faith that I had never experienced before. And I, at this point, I still didn't understand. But all I knew, it was, it was a, a, a faith, a supernatural faith that I have never experienced before. And as I went into the room, I began to look at him. I began to plead the blood of Jesus over him, what Jesus paid the price for him. I began to look at him. I began to tell him, you'll live and not die in the glory of the works of the Lord. I began to quote scriptures just coming up out of my belly that I'd been meditating on and studying. And, and I was speaking over the utensils. I was speaking over the doctors. And I said, you'll live and not die in Jesus' name. And as I left the room, as I left the room and went out in the waiting room, when this, when this drops down on the inside of you, and we're going to go down here in a minute, 1 Corinthians 12, it's talking about the spiritual gifts, which is nine of them, which we won't have time to get into all nine. But as I went out into the waiting room, 
I remembered also when I was in that room with him, I prayed, God, give him a new heart. Because I knew he hadn't had a massive heart attack. I knew damage had been done to his heart. I knew he was laying in a coma state at the time when I went in. And as I walked back into the waiting area, I, I looked over at his, at his wife and my aunt and my family. My parents were in there and some other children were around. And I was just sitting there. And this has never happened to me, but maybe a couple times also. The Lord let me see into the spirit realm. I literally saw angels. It was like a chrome metal container that was formed like a heart. And them angels were creating a new heart for him. And, and they were forming it, and it was a perfect heart that they gave him, and they were creating a new heart that by the unction of the Spirit I prayed over him. And we went, I left later that night, went home, and as I was at home, I said, we need to call and see how he's doing today. So we, and even, that again, and we're going to get into this again. When, I'll tell you, I'll tell you that the, 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 the three gifts, which I call the power gifts and the gifts of the Spirit, here in 1 Corinthians 12, one of the gifts is a gift of faith. And it's as He wills, as the Spirit of God wills. And we're going to read it here in a minute. But this gift of faith came on me. And, and how many of you know when somebody's trying to talk doubt and disbelief when this is upon you, you're like, no, 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 no. He's going to live and not die. He's going to live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. And as I went home, and then the next day we called, they actually said that he was stable. They took him to the Roanoke Memorial Hospital. And the doctors got him down there. They examined him. And literally, and this is a good time, this only time it's good to hear a doctor angry. But the doctors were angry with the hospital that he was in at sent him. And they said, why did you send him up here? We cannot find nothing wrong with his heart. Amen. He literally had to have damage because of the massive heart attack. They brought him back to life at least ten times. But what operated here, well, and you'll see in the spiritual gifts, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. Let me read a little bit more and explain. And verse 4 says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. It's the same Spirit of God that does all these gifts. Amen? But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of the spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But, one and the, but the one and the, and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. See, the spirit of God, you can't muster up enough faith to do that. You understand it. But here we're talking about what I call the power gifts. And as we studied under other ministries, we went to Raymond Bible Training Center. And, and as you study this, these three gifts are recognized as the power gifts that I'm getting ready to talk about. And one of it is what? Faith, right? It, it's a supernatural faith. It's a faith that will come on you to do something or say something, but in your natural, you would never be able to do it. It's a, it's a gift of faith. And then you've got the one, the working of miracles. And then you've got the gifts of healings. If you look that up in the Greek, healings, it's plural. It's not the singular. And I really believe the reason it is plural because there's more than one sickness and one, more than one disease. Amen? So you've got the gifts of healings. But a lot of times, when these gifts operate, they'll work together. Do you understand? Because first of all, I, we were speaking over him, he'll live and not die. That gift of faith came upon me. And I'm giving God glory, not me. I want you to understand that. Because I can't do nothing. It's all the Holy Spirit. Amen? But the, the gift of faith came on me. And then a working of miracles. Wouldn't you say giving someone a new heart is a miracle? I would. You know it? I, I would. And he gave him a new heart. Now we've got the gifts of healings. And he said, how did the gift of healings play in? Because what caused his heart to have that 
massive heart attack and heart defect needed to be healed or if God gave him a new heart, it would happen again. Do you see that? So God, a lot of times when you work in the power gifts, you, all three of them will work together or sometimes individually, one at a time. Another instance was when we was actually in Haiti last year. Two years, okay. You see, she knows the details. Two years ago, we was in Haiti. We was on a mission trip. And we was in Haiti, and this girl, and we had, what they, what's the technical word we was doing? Triage, yeah. I, I don't know, I went blank there. But triage, and, and they was taking them through, and they were seeing them, and, and they were giving them medicine, and we went up on top of this hill. We had to hike, oh. Thank God, I mean, I got in shape that trip because we had a mountain battle like that. We had to climb, taking supplies and everything else. By the grace of God, we even made it up there. I mean, our vehicle wouldn't go but so far. and It was almost like a goat path except straight up hill almost. I mean, but we got up there, and I'll tell you a funny story. We was walking, taking stuff, and I was carrying Tina's bag, and I was carrying my bag because, you know, it looks wimpy if a guy's letting somebody carry his bag, you know. So I'm carrying these bags, and this lady is about, what would you say she is? She was very old. I'm telling you, I'm not good at judging age. She had to be close to 100. She came down, and she was playing tug of war with me, trying to grab my bag. And this hill we're getting ready to go up like this, but they're used to this. You've got to realize, this is their culture. And she's grabbing that bag. No, no, and they speak Creole, so you don't understand them. You've got to have an interpreter to understand what they're saying. And she's playing tug of war to get my bag, and I'm like, I'm not letting my bag go. I'm not about to let a hundred-year-old lady take my bag up the mountain. And then I just walk behind her, woo, yeah, I feel good now, how you doing? You know, I'm, I'm refreshed, but anyway, we, we got up there, and I mean, it made us look kind of, oh, boy, y'all are out of shape. These guys were running up and down the hill, I don't know how many times before we went up at once. But we got up to the top of that hill, and we had our t they had the tent set up, it was a church. And they had the tent set up, and there was a lot of Catholic folk, too. And we had the tent set up, and as we had the tent set up, they were going through the line. We had some RNs, we had some, some nurses with us that were checking them. And then we had, and that's a whole other story, we literally had to smuggle drugs to Haiti. Do you realize that? We went through, and <laughs> it's a joke, and it was through the IPAC, so you got to get into them, not me. <laughs> we literally, no, I'm just kidding, but we literally had to put them in suitcases to go through, and guess, guess who Brother Larry Meadow says go first? Y'all go in first. So, so we had two bags full, and we would, and I was carrying hers again, because, you know, they weigh them in the, in the airport, you can't be over 50 pounds, or they charge you more and all this. So we had to get all that medicine that they gave us to get through the airport. So we had that medicine. I had to carry them like they're not that heavy, you know, and lug in yeah, I'm a big macho guy, you know. And we grabbed them, I like, got a, like 100 pounds almost, carrying it through and sitting up there. And thank God, we went right through the line. Not one of us got stopped. It was the grace of God, amen. But we, because if you know anything about Haiti, the government's crooked. And if they caught you with medicine, they would barter or they would bargain with you. And you give them money, and they keep the medicine. It doesn't go to the government. They, they, they keep it. So that's kind of what you're dealing with here. But as we got up to the top of that mountain, and, and finally we made that big journey <laughs> to the top of the mountain, and there was one young girl, how old would you say? About 14. And she, she came up t through the line, and the nurses looked at her, and the RNs, and they were giving her medicine, but they literally said that she had gangrene in her foot. Her toe was literally hanging off. It was the, not, not to make anybody sick if they have a weak stomach, but her toe was only hanging by skin. That's how bad it was. And as her toe was sitting there dangling, and the nurse said, she's got gangrene. She needs to get to the hospital, and she's probably going to lose even her foot, is what the RN said, the nurses, because they're going to have to amputate or she's going to die. Well, of course, we go over there and we say, let's pray for her. And I wasn't expecting this either. And as I began, and, and you've got to realize too, when the Spirit of God comes on you, and I know you're supposed to use wisdom. You're supposed to be used wisdom anytime you go on a mission trip, anything you do, what you drink, what you eat. But everyone that we came in contact literally had AIDS. Had AIDS. 
and the kids have aided, passed down from generation to generation. And you got to remember her foot, so it, it, it's literally not even hardly bleeding because it, it, it's so, it's dead. The foot is dead. The toe is hanging off. And she can't even move her foot, it's so limp. And I took her foot because the Spirit of God dug in. And I, I'm, I'm trying to explain this through the gifts, the spiritual gifts here, in 1 Corinthians 12. But I literally took her hand, her foot, I'm sorry, took my hand and put it around her foot. And I was looking directly at her foot, and the Spirit of God rose up on the inside of me. And dug in, I said, you will live and not die. And I was looking at her, and then I realized that the Spirit of God was speaking directly to that foot. It wasn't directly to her, but it was directly to that foot. And I told that foot, you will live and not die. We get back from a mission trip. We didn't, we didn't know what took place after that. We got back and the missionaries out there began to talk and said, it's going all through Haiti. Did you hear about that girl? She is totally whole. You see, God, God knows what he's doing. God understands. He understands everything. He's all-knowing. He's everywhere at one time, and he was on the top of that mountain to heal that, that little girl. And, and when you say that would be a miracle to you, to give someone a new foot, a new toe, that's why if we look at here, the, what I call the power gifts of working the miracles, the gift of faith, amen, and the gift of healings. Now, you know what's awesome about it? If these spiritual gifts... The nine gifts, if you look here in 1 Corinthians 12, and these gifts are as he wills now. You've got to realize something here. These nine manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit come as he wills. Who? The Holy Spirit. As he wills, as God wills. The Spirit of God will come on people. You can't muster up enough faith to do what we did, but you can. You can create an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to move in. And you're doing it this morning through worship. When you create an atmosphere to God to move in, then expect Him to show up. Amen? When you, I, I mean, I'm, sitting, I'm standing over here doing praise and worship, and I could literally tell when the, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit had entered the building. How many of you know the Holy Spirit is with you right now? It, 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 a lot of people, we pray for the Holy Spirit to come, but the Holy Spirit's right here right now. The Holy Spirit, I believe there's angels in this place right now, don't you? I believe that the Holy Spirit, I know the Holy Spirit's with me. If you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit. But then, being filled with the Holy Spirit. A whole different scenario. A whole different ball game of being, being filled. And then, uh, it's a continual state like Ephesians 5.18 talks about being filled. It's a continual state. I mean, know that sometimes life can zap you. I mean, you know that you can go through things and something will hit you flat in the face. Like what we're talking about setbacks. And we think, how am I going to make it through this day? But we need to be filled with the Spirit of God. It's a continual. If you look, look that up in the Greek also, be filled, it's a continual. It really means be, being filled. In other words, every day that we get up, I mean, the kids can tell you we, we have worship music on in the car. We're always singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. In today's time, that's what we was doing this morning, wasn't it? We was building up our most holy faith. We, we were, was coming together in unity as one accord. Now that takes us to another place. How many of you know that, that Jesus Christ had the Spirit without measure? He had the full measure of the Spirit of God living on the inside of him. But we have a measure of it. So how important is it for us to come together with that measure, that measure, that measure, that measure, and then we get the corporate anointing? Because I can't, I, and I mean, you could go down here and read more in 1 Corinthians 12, but I, I can't sit back and say, I don't need you, brother. I can't do that. I need you. I can't say, I don't need you, sister. Because I need you. Because God Gives us all gifts. You understand that? Every one of you that has been born again and have the Holy Spirit has that anointing upon them to do certain things. You understand that? Have you ever, I mean, have you ever heard somebody try to sing and they're not anointed to sing? Thank God, because there's times when God will still move, right? Because it's not about the voice. But there are certain people that are anointed to sing, the, sing praises 
and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And literally when they begin to sing, it will bring in like a wave of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I'm talking about. And, and what's awesome about this, when I was studying it years ago, I always thought these gifts of the Spirit have to operate in the church. How many of you know you're the church? This is a building which you should gather together. You should come together like I just made a comment because we need each other. How many of you know that's been going here a long time when you see somebody missing who has not been at church for a while and you begin to miss them? You begin to miss them and you go, where's brother so-and-so? Where's sister so-and-so? What are they going on? Let's give them a call and see what's going on. Because what you don't understand, they've got a gift on the inside of them that you really need. It might be a smile when they come every Sunday. It might be, you, it might be that a young teenager is coming in here contemplating suicide. And one of your greeters in the back or ushers comes up to him and smiles and just shakes their hand. You know, God loves you. And that girl, it just destroyed the work of the devil in her. That spirit of suicide left her. How important was that gift at that time? The gifts of God are so important. The anointing. And, and if you want to, let's... Uh, um, don't want to run out of time here. Well, let's go ahead real quick. Let's go to Luke 4 if we can. I don't want to hold y'all too late. If I, of course, you've got nine gifts here. We could... We could go on and on and on, but we don't want to do that. Luke 4.18, if you would. And a lot of it, very, very common passage. And I know probably every one of you in here has read this. If you're there, say, Amen. All right. Are you getting anything this morning? Amen. But the Spirit of God, let's see, Luke 4.18 the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And here I was just proving what I was saying. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me. And Jesus was anointed to do all of this. And if you remember Jesus, when he is, was, before he ascended into heaven, he gave us the Great Commission, didn't he? He told us to go out. He said, these signs will follow those who believe. You'll lay hands on the sick, and they what? Maybe recover? Shall recover. I mean, we're talking about a God that, that Jesus paid the price for everything. I don't have time, but I wanted to go over into, um, to, to show what Jesus paid the price for over into, was it Isaiah 53? And it talks about what, like the redemptive chapter, to what Jesus went through on the cross. What he went through, literally went through. But, but this morning, I want to kind of end things up here. It's 10 to 12. I don't want to take too long. Start closing down. How many of you know when I start closing down, though, it's like a, like a big old 747, it might take a while to turn and come down. So you've got to watch me here. We're coming around the, the path here. I know I, I've, I've shared a lot of things about the gifts of the Spirit. I know I've shared testimony, but how many of you know that it says that we overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony? It said they love not the lives to death. You know, we've got to have the mentality as a church, the Spirit of God needs to move mightily in every church in America right now. It needs to move mightily. There's a missing factor that I see, and I can, can I be honest here? There's a missing factor that I see in the church today, and it's the Spirit of God moving like He wants to. We have never, we have never fully tapped into the fullness of God like He expected us to. We haven't. Just little, even if we move in the gifts of the Spirit a few times, occasionally, uh, over here at the market or at the hospital or whatever, we still should be operating in the Spirit day by day basis. Do you believe that? When we get up, we should be so aware of the Spirit of God. 
When we go to bed, we should be so aware of the Spirit of God. We have to recognize that the Spirit of God is with me when I wake up, when I go to bed. Amen? We need to understand, and, and I've got some things here I do want to read, if I can. And I've got a topic here that says, Christians are meant to live the presence and power of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit helps us to confess Jesus as Lord. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. The Holy, number two, the Holy Spirit empowers us to serve God with supernatural power. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. The Holy Spirit binds us together as the body of Christ. Does that corporate anointing again? 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. The Holy Spirit helps us to pray. Romans 8, 26. The Holy Spirit ever intercedes for us with God the Father. Romans 8, 27. The Holy Spirit guides us, Galatians 5, 25. The Holy Spirit helps us to live like Jesus, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Now can you really this morning say, I don't have no need of the Holy Spirit? We have to on a day-to-day -day basis. Live with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So this morning, if I can, I know it's getting late and I want to wrap things up here. But I want to open the altar this morning. Maybe you're going through sickness and disease this morning. How many of you know that the Spirit of God can heal you this morning? How many of you know that the anointing destroys the yoke of bondage? Whatever is bondage in your life, that yoke that is around your neck, it, it might be sickness, it might be depression, it might be discouragement, it might be a lack of finances this morning, you don't know how you're going to pay the bills next week. Whatever it is this morning, I want to pray for you. I want, I want to give an altar call if everybody would stand up with me right now, this morning. To me it seems easier for people to make a move when they stand up. Because I probably put you to sleep first of all. No, I'm kidding. But if we could have somebody to, to play or sing. And I'm open. And, and quit thinking about lunch now. I'm hungry too. The kids ate, but I didn't get to this morning. <laughs> Got to feed the kids, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Got to be a daddy. But this morning, as she begins to pray, if there's anything in your life this morning, and first of all, you might have everybody fooled. And what I really wanted to get into even more and I ran out of time, one of the reasons that you're empowered with the Holy Spirit is for salvation. If you go on further into Acts 2 after they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, you notice that they, they were gathered together and daily they were fellowshipping, they were taking communion, they were breaking bread, and it talks about how the Lord was adding to them daily. That's the church, isn't it? As we begin to come together in unity daily, God is going to add to the church. Somebody in it, I mean, a lot of people, and they have some good classes out there about church growth and use wisdom and go to them, but what is the best church growth? It's when you love one another. When you come together in fellowship. When you, if you don't see somebody for a while, you don't know what they're going through. I believe these apostles, when they gathered in, in uh, Acts 2, I believe when they came together, they were able to be accountable to one another. They said, brother, sister, I've been going through this. Will you pray for me? And as they came together and accountable to one another, submitting to one another in the love of God, they grew. God sent, sent people to them. People just didn't happen on the doorstep. God sent people to them. When you show yourself faithful that you're a church of love, God will send people to you. God will have them outside the door. So this morning, the first thing I want to ask you, you might have somebody fooled this morning, and there's no embarrassment, that you might say, Brother, I'm not even born again. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to... Even come down here boldly. But if that's you, raise your hand and wave it at me. We was all at that place one time. We've all sinned and came short of the glory of God. But then we were made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You understand that? 
we were made right standing in God's eyes the moment we cried out to the Lord. Amen. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Is there anybody here says, I don't, I don't know Jesus. I need him this morning. Anybody at all, any hand looking around. Well, praise God. That's a good thing. And I'll give you opportunity, even after service is over, if you was embarrassed. You can get born again in your bathroom. You can get born again in the bathtub. You can get born again in your bedroom, in the living room, as long as you call out on the name of the Lord. Amen? And confess in Christ Jesus as Lord of Lords. The next thing, maybe you've been dealing with some sicknesses and illnesses. And Tina's here to pray with me too. And you say, I just need prayer this morning. I've been suffering so long. You might be somebody here suffering from depression. They might, you might be thinking and the devil might be filling your mind with junk saying it's not going to get any better. Look at you. You're a failure. But I got news for you. There's life. And Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. Today's a new day. We want to put it under the carpet. We want to throw it out the door. If that's you, I want you to come down here and let me pray for you. Sickness, disease, whatever it is, I want to pray with you. You might have discouragement this morning. You might be so discouraged that you don't know where to go, what to do. You might be seeking the will of God this morning for your life. And I tell a lot of people, if you want to know the will of God, then the Word of God is the will of God for your life. And you get in the Word and God will begin to reveal it to you. And He'll begin to show you His plan for your life. Amen? So anybody, if you need prayer for anything this morning, I want you to come down. I want to pray with you. Because God's heart is for not, you not to leave here hurting or suffering. Amen? The compassion of Jesus. He would look out among them and he would weep. He says, I have need of a shepherd. Pray labors into the harvest. Jesus couldn't pass somebody sick when they exercised faith. And Jesus would lay hands on them. And they would be healed. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. We thank you, Father God, in the name of